Assalamu alaikum everybody. So after having gone through the buckling of columns, I want to carry on with our theme of looking at failure in structures. But this time around, I want to look at failure arising because of fracture. So this will be an introductory lecture into fracture mechanics. And for this part of the course, we will be using the reference book by Callister and Lethwich, the one shown right here. Please do download it and then go through chapter eight. Okay, so why do we need fracture mechanics? Basically, all real world materials and components have naturally have inherent flaws or cracks within them. Now these flaws or cracks act as stress concentrators, that is they cause uh, the loading to be amplified in their vicinity. For ductile materials, uh, the material can actually yield wherever these cracks are such that the, 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 the strength of the entire component does not tend to get uh, uh, significantly compromised by that or significantly affected by it. Therefore, when we're looking at the failure of ductile materials, we don't actually need to consider the effect of these flaws. As a, as a result, you may recall that when we had looked at the yield criteria, that is the Tresca and the von Mises yield criteria that we had looked at previously, we had no, we did not include these flaws within our discussion at all. But this is not the case for brittle materials, where the effect of these stress concentrators can be extremely significant. Now. The, the theory of failure that we've looked at before, the maximum normal stress failure theory that we looked at for brittle materials, it does not take into, inherent, uh, take into account these flaws that may exist in the material and therefore is actually completely insufficient. And as I said to you when we had uh, discussed it, that it was a very, very basic primitive theory. What we actually need to do to look at the fracture of brittle materials is to include the effect of these cracks and flaws on the uh, failure of the material. Now, uh, this field, uh, looking at the effect of cracks on the fracture of uh, brittle materials, is known as, uh, on, on the failure of materials, is known as fracture mechanics. Right. So, um, I'm sure we are all familiar with various examples of fracture occurring in our uh, daily lives. Uh, for example, uh, where we must have broken a number of windows while playing cricket uh, in the street or uh, something along those lines. But this, the, the, the real world examples that we are familiar with tend to be for brittle materials such as glass or ceramic. But the truth of the matter is that even ductile materials tend to undergo fracture failure. For example, the one, the, the ship shown right here, which probably was made of some sort of steel that has fractured into two. An aircraft shown right here where uh, the fuselage has completely uh, been broken off from the main, main body of the airplane. Um, and finally, even... Um, Every time we tear something, we may not think of it that way, but this is also, tearing is also a um, mode of fracture, basically an example of fracture, right? Okay, so as we can see from our previous examples that different materials actually undergo different types of fracture. Broadly speaking, we have two types of fracture, that is brittle fracture and ductile fracture. Now, in brittle fracture, the material actually basically has a stress strain curve as we're familiar with that looks like this and then it just fractures now the key point here is that when this material fails it leads to a sudden catastrophic fracture um, uh, with, which sort of occurs without any warning and leads to complete catastrophic failure now the material tends to remain within the linear elastic regime with almost no plastic deformation occurring before failure and this also occurs at relatively small strains. In contrast, ductile materials tend to undergo fracture after having undergone significant amounts of plastic deformation and then fracturing. Now this is much more stable than brittle fracture and thus and, and gives us a warning when the specimen might be about to fail and thus this is much more desirable than brittle fracture. 
Now, there are two branches of fracture mechanics that deal with these types of materials. So, brittle fracture is analyzed using linear elastic fracture mechanics because the material remains within its linear elastic regime. Whereas for ductile fracture, we need to consider elastic plastic fracture mechanics. Elastic plastic fracture mechanics. Now, in this course, we will be dealing at uh, dealing with just a much simpler uh, brittle fracture uh, that is looking at linear elastic fracture mechanics. Right. So, another example of the two different types of uh, fracture. So, if you if let let's look at uh, the failure of some some pipeline. Now, if we have the material undergoing ductile fracture, then what we tend to see is that here we have our crack and we can clearly see just the one or the two pieces of the of the component um, with large plastic deformation clearly visible whereas for brittle fracture the component breaks down into a number of pieces um, and there is little to no visible uh, uh, deformation basically right even when we consider the fracture surfaces what we see is that a ductile material tends to undergo significant necking before fracturing a material somewhere whereas a brittle material basically has no necking and just shows a flat surface like so a material somewhere in between will have a little bit of necking but then it will just fracture uh, um, after a small amount of necking uh, a small amount of necking now, when we look at these fracture surfaces, for ductile fracture, we tend to see our cup and cone type of fracture where these shear lips or necking can be seen to occur. Whereas for our brittle fracture, we see a flat cleavage uh, surface. Right. Now, the reason this happens is that for ductile materials, what happens in the fracture process is that basically you get some initial necking arising because of plastic deformation and then internally in the material we get to uh, we get some uh, cavities or voids which start to form as we carry on deforming it these voids start to join up together that is they start to coalesce coalesce and when they join together, they lead to the formation of a much larger crack. And then this crack basically propagates through the material leading to fracture, uh, leaving behind a fracture surface, which often looks slightly uh, uh, fibrous. Um, even here we can see, so there are, this was probably an old void and an old void and where these voids sort of join together, we see these ridges forming right here, right? So it's a, uh, um, a fibrous sort of uh, ridged uh, surface. Whereas for a brittle material, we see a much um, flatter, uh, more like a cleavage morphology. So, for example, look here, it's, um, it's completely flat. And we see these lines which tend to point towards the um, sort of the initiation point of the crack. For this figure, for example, we can sort of see that there are these, these lines are called ridge lines that are pointing towards the center of the image, which is probably where the um, fracture initiated right now this entire study of looking at fracture surfaces to analyze what type of fracture it is whether it's ductile or brittle fracture is known as fractography and it's important because it allows us to uh, analyze um, when failure has occurred uh, that what type of fracture it is so that we can come up with mechanisms later on to prevent that failure occurring again Okay, so we've seen that the, whether the material behaves in a ductile or brittle manner, of course it depends on the material, but it also actually depends on the temperature and the rate of loading uh, that the material is undergoing. So for example, for the temperature, some materials actually have this transition temperature known as the ductile to brittle transition temperature, um, below which those materials behave in a brittle manner. 
Now, this is very common for BCC materials, body centric cubic materials, which have this DBTT uh, ductile to brittle transition temperature, uh, such that if you are if you are uh, if the material is operating at a uh, low temperature it behaves in a brittle manner whereas if it's operating at a high temperature then it behaves in a ductile manner now if you recall i'd shown you the image of the ship that had fractured in two and i'm sure you're all also familiar with the example of the titanic now the reason why these ships had undergone failure is because the the ships were operating at a cold temperature such that they, they were operating below their ductile to brittle transition temperature and hence they were much more susceptible to brittle fracture. So as a designer, we must ensure that we remain above the DBTT for materials which possess it so that they behave in a ductile manner. Right. Okay. So... Um, uh, we've looked at the types of fracture, but there are also different uh, modes of loading which lead to different modes of fracture. So one is when you have your crack like so in the specimen, and then the material or component is being loaded up in tension like so, such that the crack opens. Now this is known as mode 1, uh, an opening fracture mode. But there are also other modes of fracture. Um, uh, so for example in mode 2 we have in plane shearing which leads to shearing propagation of the crack and mode 3 where it is out of plane shearing which leads to basically a tearing mode of fracture now in this course we will only be looking at mode 1 the tensile opening fracture mode because this is the one which uh, is the most dominant one in terms of uh, fracture that occurs in the real world uh, and the materials are more susceptible to failing this way rather than these two in these two modes okay so with that discussion let's have a, an activity right here where we have a fracture surface um, like so we've got an image of it this was basically an axle tube uh, made of cold drawn uh, steel and what we want to do is basically look at this fracture surface and determine whether this was brittle fracture ductile fracture or a combination of the two so we'll discuss this in our online session have a think about this Please note that this is the primary fracture surface, all of this part right here. So what, what does it look like? Okay, great. So um, above, uh, we've just had a qualitative discussion of fracture. Now let's move on to actually quantitatively analyzing fracture failure. Um, but in order to do that, we first need to think about, as always, what happens when materials are failing. Now, if you're breaking a body into two, of course, this means that we are breaking its bonds. Now, when we theoretically analyze how much energy is required in bond breaking, it turns out that we significantly overestimate um, the, the strength of materials, basically. Now, the reason why physically in the real world, um, materials tend to fail at much lower loading than their theoretical bond strengths is because all real world materials have inherent as i mentioned these inherent flaws within them now these flaws basically act like stress concentrators as we've discussed so for example if i look at a plate like so which is being loaded in uniaxial tension with a an elliptical crack let's say or an elliptical hole within it then i know that this elliptical hole basically acts like a stress concentrator such that when i look at my stress along this x x prime profile that is if i look at it along the x x prime profile with the crack being in the middle right here then i see that when i'm away from the crack when i'm away, the crack is right here or the elliptical hole then when i'm away from it that is somewhere here or here then I reach my nominal loading of sigma naught. But at the, or in the vicinity of the crack, close to the crack, I see that the stress is actually much larger, right? So clearly these 
uh, these inherent flaws or cracks act like stress concentrators. Now, let's see exactly how these uh, cracks uh, affect the um, stress profile in their vicinity. Now, let me carry on looking at my my plate, which is being loaded in uniaxial loading with a center crack within it of length 2a. Now, what I'm doing, what's different from the last slide is that I'm looking at a perfect crack. Now, a perfect crack basically means that the crack tip is perfectly sharp. Okay, that means there is no curvature, there is no blunting. It is a perfect crack. And then from that crack tip, let me look at, let me define the position from the crack tip. So I can look at, let's say, okay, that I'm a distance of R away from it at an angle of theta and so on. So I'm just defining my spatial coordinates this way. And then I'm going to look at the stress state uh, at any given point away from this crack tip. Now, of course, in 2D, my stress state uh, has uh, normal stresses and the shear stresses. But because I'm only applying a normal, a macroscopic uh, sigma yy, I'll only consider my normal stress in the y direction uh, of being important, right? So let's, let's, let's see what happens if I have a perfectly sharp crack, right? So if I draw out my sigma yy, at a distance r away from the crack tip right here and this is a perfect crack then basically I see that at the crack tip that is when r is equals to 0 I basically get to an infinite stress that is this this infinite stress at the crack tip is known as a stress singularity so basically, the stress, uh, the, the crack, perfect crack acts like such a stress concentrator that the stress goes to infinity at the crack tip. Now this is very interesting because uh, of course if you have an infinite stress, then that can clearly lead to um, failure or fracturing of the material uh, at much lower applied stresses, sigma applied. Now, People, engineers have come before us and who have already analyzed what the analytical expression for sigma yy looks like. Now basically sigma yy takes this expression right here where, where um, the, the only thing of importance to note is that indeed it does have an inverse relationship with R. That is when you have r is equals to zero, that is when you're at the crack tip, then sigma yy, that is the stress at the crack tip, goes to infinity. Now, for fracture mechanics, in order to analyze how much that crack tip causes a stress uh, concentration, what we do is we take a look at this numerator and define this to be a new factor called k and because I was in mode 1 loading I'm going to call it k1. Now this k1 basically is known as the stress intensity factor because basically what this k1 is defining or measuring is how much the applied loading sigma applied gets magnified ahead of this crack tip. Okay so it tells me how high is the stress intensity at this crack tip? So it is a crude measure of the uh, stress concentration effect of the uh, crack, basically. Right? So clearly we see that this stress intensity factor K1 is actually a function of, uh, of the applied loading sigma applied, but also, so it's a function of the applied loading, but also of the crack so A was the crack length, total crack length was 2A. So A is a measure of the crack length basically. So how big the crack is, A will be larger. And that would lead to a more uh, a higher stress intensity. And also stress intensity factor K is also a factor of this Y parameter, which basically we'll deal with in the next slide. So this 
y is is just a geometric parameter which takes into account the geometry of our component or our specimen now if i i carry on looking at the plate that i was considering before which was an infinite plate something like so with a crack in its center of length 2a then my stress intensity factor k1 takes this expression right here where i can see that clearly my y is equals to 1 whereas if i look at some other geometry of my of my um, specimen for example if i consider actually a semi infinite plate semi infinite means that it has an edge right here it has if an actual edge right here but then is infinite here infinite here and infinite here and the crack is actually on its edge like so with the length of a then k takes an expression like sh like the one shown right here which shows us that y is actually approximately equals to 1.122 right now these are the two most commonly used specimens or um, geometries for fracture mechanics analysis um, but some other ones also exist so for example what if we had a finite plate finite means that it has some some small measurable quantifiable dimension such as the one shown here so it has a finite width and a finite height uh, and it has a center crack then y takes an expression in terms of the dimensions of the plate like shown but as I said, the, the infinite plate with the center crack and the semi-infinite plate with the edge crack are the most commonly used ones. Right. So we see that not only is the um, expression for the stress intensity factor, that is the 4k1 dependent on the geometry of the problem, but another thing that I want to point out right here, that even this, the measure of the crack length a differs depending on the geometry so for example when I have my infinite plate then my crack total crack dimension is actually 2a and only half of that um, crack length goes into the expression right here whereas if I have an edge crack in a semi infinite plate then it is the total length of the of the crack so just be mindful of this, that what is the length of the crack that is uh, going into the expression for the stress and density factor, right? So we see that our stress intensity factor, basically which gives us a measure of how much stress concentration effect is arising because of a crack, is a factor that depends on the geometry of the problem, so it depends on y. It depends, of course, on the applied loading. So the higher the applied loading, the higher the stress intensity would be. And it depends on the geometry of the crack. Right. So how do we take this stress intensity factor then and then determine whether a material would fail because of fracture? Now, this is where someone called Irwin came along. And Irwin, I think his name was George Irwin, I, think, I, I believe a British engineer, in 1957, so that's, that's not, not too far, not too, not too long ago, pretty recent, he postulated that a material with fracture, if due to a certain loading and a certain flaw, the stress intensity factor K1 that we can measure exceeds some material-specific uh, material specific fracture toughness uh, known as KC so a, a if it exceeds a material property material fracture toughness then failure would occur right that is written out we are saying that we have this material specific material pro basically we have a material property uh, the fracture toughness of a material KC and fracture will occur if for our given loading the K, the stress intensity factor, exceeds the material fracture toughness. That's when failure would occur. Whereas if for our given loading, the stress intensity factor is less than the fracture toughness of the material, then uh, fracture does not occur. 
Okay, so this is uh, how we basically known as the Irwin uh, is, is known as Irwin's fracture criteria, um, and essentially that's how we will determine whether uh, a material is going to fracture or not under a given set of loading. Okay. Now, clearly our stress intensity factor K1 increases as you have more loading. So if you have higher stress and if you have a longer crack, that means that the largest, the longest crack with the highest stress acting on it will be the uh, one that causes failure if, if failure is to occur. Okay, right. Now, just one last comment on this, that all of this we have been discussing for mode 1, which is why I have my K1 right here, and my fracture toughness is also for K1C. But the same argument, the analogy similarly applies for mode 2 and mode 3, the only difference being that in those two cases, our stress and density factors are then known as K2 and K3. Great. Okay, yes, so basically we um, as engineers what we tend to do is that we have to find this material property then we need to find what the fracture toughness or KC is for different materials and how we do this is that we perform various tests, we take a specimen, we put in an intentional crack in it and then we load it up and then we see when it fails basically when it fractures and from that we can determine what its fracture toughness is. Now what ends up happening interestingly is that when we measure this material specific fracture toughness property it actually ends up depending on the thickness of the specimen such that if we have very thin so I'm plotting the fracture toughness that I'm measuring of the material against the thickness of the plate then it turns out that if I have thin plates that is if I have a low thickness I'm somewhere here then the plane the the fracture toughness is not constant it is changing it's depending on the thickness whereas if I use a very thick plate somewhere here and I have basically plane strain behavior then I see that my fracture toughness does become independent of the geometry of the material and is then is taken to be our material specific fracture toughness. Okay, so this then gives me a material property known as the plane strain fracture toughness of the material, which is the one then I that I then use to compare and figure out whether the material will fail under different situations or not. Now this criteria to determine when we have got to our plane strain behavior for our plate thickness, uh, basically we define that how thick our plate needs to be in order for our test to be, our fracture test to basically be under plane strain. That is for us to correctly measure the fracture toughness of the material. And we define basically that our plate thickness needs to be larger than this value right here. That is um, our fracture toughness divided by the yield strength of the material squared. And if we do that, then our material is in uh, plane strain behavior for our fracture, for the purposes of fracture testing. Okay. So moving on from that, now we know that our stress intensity factor takes this expression right here. So if we, if we want to find when failure would occur, basically we just need to substitute in our material specific fracture toughness, the one right here. So this will be, as we've just discussed, our plane strain fracture toughness. Now next we have Y, which is our uh, geometry factor. So it depends on the specimen and the crack geometry. And finally our applied load and our uh, crack length size or flaw size basically. So now we can do two things so in terms of designers. So one situation is when we actually already have our material and we know what the uh, what the flaw size is in it. So we know that we have a material and the largest flaw is let's say of some size, some given size A. 
then what we can do is that we can rearrange this expression to find what design stress that given component is able to withstand without failure. So if we rearrange it and we can find what is the critical stress below which we have to remain. Right? So that is we have a fixed material and a fixed geometry and we know what the largest flaw is in it. From that we can find what is the maximum stress that that material will be able to undertake. The other way around, what if we have a given loading situation uh, such that we know what our stress that we want to our, want our specimen to bear is then we rearrange this expression in terms of the finding what the flaw size in that component must be okay so there are two ways to go about this uh, design process basically okay so with that let's actually look at some uh, engineering materials and what their fracture toughnesses are. So basically on the left right here I have my yield strength of the material and on my K1C I have my fracture toughness. So please note that this is the measure of how strong the material is, the strength and the fracture toughness is a measure of how tough the material is that is resistant to fracture. Right. So it turns out that our ductile materials, that is the ones which have a high yield strength such as these metals, aluminium, titanium, etc. who behave in a ductile manner, they also have high, mm, uh, uh, sorry, uh, so ductile materials have high fracture toughnesses as we can see right here. Whereas if I look at brittle materials such as ceramics, then for those, for one, it's very difficult to find what their yield strength is because they fail because of fracture such that we see that their fracture toughnesses are very low compared to metals whereas if we see polymers then they're somewhere in between uh, some of them have pretty high yield strengths and also quite and they also have high um, uh, fracture toughnesses so essentially for an ideal material what we want is that if I plot the strength of my material here and my fracture toughness on my vertical axis then ideally I want to be somewhere right here in this domain. Why? Because materials right here have a high fracture toughness and a high yield strength. So those materials if we plot the plot different uh, types of materials on this on this graph we see that indeed we have metals on the top right corner some composites also make it there CFRP etc um, but then um, where are where are my polymers so polymers are here so they have a um, they have a little they have fairly high tough high high strength and somewhere in between toughness whereas if i come to the left completely right here further uh, on this side where is my so concrete for example right here concrete which has very low fracture toughness and also uh, it's a bit difficult to determine what its strength is so it's somewhere right here probably given the compressive strength so the point is we want to be on the top right corner for this graph where we have materials which have high strength and high fracture toughness but please do not forget that this is just two criteria that we might have as designers we also would like our materials to have low density um, uh, and uh, low cost as well of course okay so such um, uh, design graphs can be very useful for us okay so uh, that's primarily it for fracture toughness. I just want to make a few more comments. So for example, we've got our, our stress intensity factor from which we can find what will be the allowable stress that a given component with a given flaw size can bear. Or in, in, in another case, we, we can find what critical flaw size uh, is, is, uh, is, uh, can be allowed in the specimen. Mm, given that we require a particular loading but what is important in all of this is to note that 
whether fracture occurs or not of course then depends on the material so on the fracture toughness of the material it depends on the geometry it depends on the applied stress and it depends on the presence of flaws so as an example what if we take a brittle material something like glass and actually manufacture it in such a way that it basically has no flaws then I'll just show you an image of something like that. So here I have a glass fiber which has no cracks at all or basically for our purposes no cracks at all and in that case we see that I'm able to bend that glass fiber so much. Take a look at how, 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 how heavily deformed it is. Now in this glass fiber we are going up till bending stresses of 5000 megapascals, so 5 gigapascals, whereas normally glass fractures are at about 100 to 200 megapascals. And the reason for this is that fracture occurs because of the presence of flaws. So do not forget this. We need this entire branch of fracture mechanics in order to analyze what is it, what size of the flaw will lead to failure or not okay will lead to fracturing or not okay so um with that i think i have a few examples um in part two of the video